Good afternoon, ladies. I am Marilyn Stowers, Executive Pastor of Riverview Church of God in St. Louis, where R. Andre Epps serves as Senior Pastor. I am also the Women's Clergy Connector for the Missouri Women's Christian Connection. Thank you for inviting me to serve you today. You have been given some wonderful information already, and I know that your spirits should be stirred into fellowship with God. So please be sure to take advantage of what you received and use what you've been given. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for your presence and for always being with us. We thank you, Lord, for this fellowship and our time together. May we learn and grow in you, receiving the knowledge, power, and love that you have for us. It is in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Now, my assignment today is to lead us through the who and the how of prayer. The battle is not of flesh and blood. And in order to effectively fight this battle, we must know that our weapons are scripture, which is the word of God, and prayer. We have the basic understanding that prayer is talking to God. And I don't know about you, but I've come to learn that conversations are much more meaningful when we're speaking to someone that we have a special relationship with. So I pray that each of you have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. Now, if you don't, you can, just simply by asking him into your heart right now. And the good news is that he hears and answers our prayer. Now, I want you to take a moment and think about your relationship with the Lord. Now, I don't want us to take for granted the privilege we have and the ability to go to him in prayer and the power that's associated with it. We don't want to put him in a box and limit his role in our lives because after all, he is everything we need. He is all things to us at all times. And when it comes to relationships, no matter what kind it is, they all work better when we understand our roles. So I want you to think about or even write down who he is and make it personal. And I'll share uh, a few of the words in a word cloud in just a moment. So here is the word cloud and it's giving you a few ideas of who he is, not a fully exhaustive list or anything like that, but we know him as our Lord. And I'm gonna make it personal too. He is my heavenly father. He is my savior. He is my redeemer. He is my deliverer. He is my counselor. He is my friend. He is my healer and so much more. He's everything that I need him to be at any given moment. And during this pandemic, some of us have come to see him in a different light. For some, we've come to know him even more as a provider as unemployment increases and resources decrease. And for others, we've come to know him as our comforter as we mourn the loss of our friends and loved ones. He is all powerful, ever-present, all-knowing, he is holy, he is righteous and just. So when we acknowledge who he is in his attributes, let us be careful not to ever demote him to just being the spiritual genie or Santa Claus or the man upstairs, because we're not lucky, we're blessed, and we don't make wishes, we say prayers. Prayer is our communication with God, our time with him. We know him to be the resource of our strength, the source of our strength, where our power comes from. He is our lifeline. And when it comes to prayer, we take for granted who we're talking to. And so my question to you is, do you realize who you're really talking to? Because it seems that we get to a place where we do so many things out of habit or routine, we forget why we're really doing it and the importance of it. We know what we're praying for, 
because many times we're asking for help, or healing, or something. And some of our prayers have gotten to be so routine that they're more like grocery lists. God, I need. God, I want. Husband, house, job, car. You fill in the blank. But we have gotten, or rather we have forgotten what a privilege it is to go to the Father in prayer and the power that's associated with it. Many prayers go up without faith as if we do not trust that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And I say that because there are many of us who give things to God in prayer, and then we turn around and take it right back. We get up from our knees and we say, okay, I've got to go do this, and I've got to fix that, and I need to go take care of this situation. Now, don't forget, God still loves a cheerful giver even in this area. So give him your burdens and your cares too. First Peter 5 and 7 reminds us that we are to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Too many of us are losing sleep over things that should be resting in God's hands. So I have to ask when you're praying, do you know who you're talking to? Now, when I was growing up, my mother would have to ask me that question after I've used the wrong tone of voice or perhaps said the wrong thing to her. And she'd say, do you know who you're talking to? Hey, when that came to me like that, it was time for me to get my act together or get out of Dodge because I was in trouble. It was time for me to acknowledge that I was speaking to my mother, someone who loved me, cared for me, taught me, protected me, provided for me, who had authority and guardianship over my life. I belonged to her and she knew what was best for me. And in my approach in communicating with her at that particular time was not appropriate. Had I remembered who I was talking to, I wouldn't have said what I said or used the tone that I used. Or I would have refrained from asking for things that she had already said no to. Now, when we approach God, we must realize that God is infinitely far above our ability to fully understand. But he tells us through his word and the scriptures very specific truths about himself so that we can know what he is like and we can get to know him better, and we can be drawn to worship him. So I ask, do we know who we're talking to? Let us look at some of the names of God. Now, as we become familiar with the names of God and the meaning of them, it helps us to get to know him better. It helps us to know who he really is and more about his character. And there are many more names than what I've listed. And this is just for the sake of example, because you need to study and learn this for yourselves. And as we pray though, and we begin to know and acknowledge who he is, like uh, one of his names is Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is my peace. We receive peace in the fullness of his spirit. When we pray to Jehovah Jireh, our provider, we are acknowledging that we are approaching the one who is the provision of our needs. And when we pray to Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals, we know that the benefit is soundness of body and spirit. And really, that's just scraping the top of the surface. That's just the name of you. But are we remembering who he is and his attributes? Lord, Father, Savior, Redeemer, Deliverer, Counselor, the one who is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, holy, righteous, and just. When we are consciously aware of the powerful, loving one we are approaching, the tone, the content, and expectation of our conversations with him, they would change. Now, when it came to my mother, had I approached her as a child, remembering and acknowledging that I was speaking to my mother, a person of authority in my life, my response and my tone during the conversation would have been much more respectful. And that's why it's important to know our place, to know our role. And the thing is, knowing who you are is the beginning of true victory in this spiritual warfare. And knowing who you are in Christ always 
allows you to live your life as God intended and to fulfill his purpose in your life. So let us get a better understanding of who we are. Let us look at who God says we are. Oh, wow. Look at that. I mean, just look at it. Did you know that you were all that? You are beautiful. You are lovely. You are loved. You are chosen. Just simply choose to believe what God says about you. Even just starting with the fact that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are cared for. You are protected. You are unique. You are forgiven. You are created for a purpose. You are his. And just I have many of them listed. There's so many more in the Bible, but as you just let this soak in and come into the knowledge of who you are in him, you will begin to gain a better understanding of your relationship with him and your role as his child, a king's kid. Now, this sums it up. I don't know who the author is, but the title is Who You Are. And it says, you're not just an ordinary person. You're a child of the living God. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're not just a sinner. You're a new creation in Christ. You're part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are one of God's chosen people. Now, just think about that. Think about where you are right now, your position in life, and what he is to you in this moment. You may not feel beautiful, but you are in his sight. You may not feel strong, but in your weakness, he is made strong. In our time of need, he is our provider. In our sickness, he is our healer. And when you have a clear definition of our relationship and an understanding of our role, doesn't that just change your conversation with him? Knowing your God-given identity gives you confidence. It gives you self-esteem and awareness. Knowing who you are and whose you are changes everything. And if you truly realize that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that would change the way you view yourself. So when you pray, speak to him from that place of understanding your role as his child, as the one he called, the one he chose, and the one he loves. He loves you more than anything. God wants you to know that he loves you very much. He loved you enough to send his son to die for your sins and mine. There are so many believers who don't know him as well as they should. And this explains why we go through so many unnecessary changes and don't use the power that he's given us to overcome or even endure certain situations. Too many of us have a casual relationship with him when he desires an intimate relationship. We are his bride, not a blind date. And that's why I have to ask. Do you really know who you're talking to? In the Bible, knowing someone meant that you are very close to them. We're speaking of an intimate relationship. How do you get to know someone and don't spend time with them? When we get to know God through his word in our time of prayer, he is the loving father and we are his children. That's what we get to know. And in Isaiah 43 and 4, we are reminded that we are precious in his sight and honored and he loves us. Just think about the relationship of how a parent loves a child and would do anything for them. Conversations come naturally to them because conversations come naturally for those who we're connected to and have a relationship with. And it doesn't happen overnight. Relationships take time. The relationship with our Heavenly Father is built on our conversations with Him as we allow Him to enter into our lives. Just think about someone you're close to. When something happens in your life, whether it's good or bad, the first thing you do is you call them and you tell them what happened, or you visit them and you have that conversation of what's going on in your life. 
Do we do the same thing with God? I mean, we really need to get in the habit of talking to God on a regular basis. I can't stress that enough. That is how relationships are built. So how do you talk to God? Now, it's easy to get caught up in wondering about how to talk to God and if there's a correct way to pray, but all you have to do is speak. Just speak. Simply tell God what is on your heart by talking to him, our Heavenly Father, because he cares for you and he wants you, his child, to cry out to him. Focus on building your relationship with him by communicating with him, by spending time with him. Just sharing your life and giving of yourself. And be yourself. He already knows you. And just let your words flow as if you're talking to a friend. And yes, there are certain styles of prayer and postures for prayer and formats that people use. But in respect of time, let's just start right here, just with the relationship building and some basic information on how to pray. Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 7 tells us to pray without ceasing. So let's start with that. Pray without ceasing. Relationships are built on the frequency of conversation after all. The more you talk to someone, the more you get to know them. Think about how often you talk to the closest people in your life, your spouse, your friends, your parents, your children. The more often you talk to them, the closer you become. And with each conversation, you gain more knowledge about them and their lives that you wouldn't otherwise know unless you had communicated. When we go days and weeks and months without talking to someone, we're just not as close and the relationship begins to suffer. Now, I'm still connected with some of the friends I grew up with, but we don't live in the same city and we sometimes go months without talking. Now, we know the major events that's taking place in each other's lives and we catch up quickly when we get a chance to talk, but we don't have that day-to-day -day knowledge and intimacy that we once had. This is the same with God. The more you talk with him, the closer you will be to him and you'll begin to feel his presence. And the pray without ceasing is just that, staying connected to him keeping in communication with him at all times. Pray when you wake up, pray as you drive, pray before you get out of your car at work, pray over your children as they play, pray as you face decisions and concern throughout the day, pray when you feel the stress, the worry and the doubt creeping into your heart. Say a prayer of thanksgiving as you acknowledge how God is working and moving in your life. Thank him for being who he is and for loving you as he does. He just loves us so much that we can't even fathom it. And then when you don't feel like praying, you still need to just let him know. He already knows what's going on with you. You just say, Lord, help me today. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who intercedes on our behalf and prays for us when we don't even know how to pray. Lord, I am frustrated. Lord, I am weak. Lord, I can't put my words together right now. I cannot organize my thoughts, but you know what I'm going through, Father, and I'm just praying for you to just take control of my spirit, Lord. Take control of me. Take a hold of me, Lord God. Give me strength because I'm just weary and tired right now. And guess what? By the time you get through telling God all that, at the end of your conversation, I guarantee you, you probably will end up praising him. But while you get through whining about why you can't pray, guess what? You were praying because you were talking to God. But also, what we need to do is make sure that we allow room for God to speak. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in the company of someone who dominates the conversation and makes it all about them? <laughs> Well, I think we've all been in those at one point or another, but these are not always enjoyable or productive conversations. A good conversation is always a two-sided conversation. Now, we tend to call out to God in prayer, and then we don't even give him an opportunity to answer. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, call to me and I will answer you. 
and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. We need to allow time for him to speak to us as we would in any other conversation. Just think about it. When we have conversations with those who are close to us, we typically begin the exchange of, with greetings. And then we ask how the other is doing. We might pay a compliment. We may encourage them and ask them what's going on in their lives. We may even give advice. We may offer to assist with something or share with them where we have a need in our lives and they would do the same for us. You know, a typical conversation. God wants this same kind of conversation with us. So maybe in your conversation with God, if you said, I don't know what to say, you know, start with the compliment. Acknowledge something amazing that you noticed that God created. A uh, beautiful sunrise or an awe-inspiring moment or thank him for his creation or blessings in your life or both. You can pray the names of God as we talked about earlier. Lord, because you are my healer, I'm praying for you to touch my body. You can pray the scriptures. You can pray some of his promises that are found in the scripture. Lord, you said that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. So I have no reason to fear. I'm never alone. Plus, Lord, I know that you've not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Just a couple examples there. But then, instead of just making a list of demands and requests, also ask him for guidance and direction. Ask him to speak his truths into your heart. This makes the conversation more two-sided by inviting him to enter into the discussion. Then what we need to do is make sure that as he speaks, we are listening. If we don't take the time to listen in a conversation, then we're just talking at someone and they're not likely to continue the relationship for very long. God wants us to listen for him too. And we can hear him when he speaks to us just through his word, by reading and meditation, um, meditating on scripture, when singing and praying the Psalms. You can listen to God speak through his creation by being still before him in his presence. And sometimes he sent anointed people our way to speak a word into us. So just make sure that you're careful when you're listening for him, acknowledging that you recognize his voice. Because, you know, how do you go to someone and ask for something and don't wait to receive what you ask for? All throughout the Psalms, David models someone who waits on God in this way. In Psalm 62, verse 1, he says, My soul waits in silence for God only. Then in Psalms 42, he says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? See, there is so much we can learn from David when it comes to prayer in the Psalms. He knew how to approach God. And, you know, he didn't hesitate to do it either. He knew how to come to his heavenly father for whatever it was that he needed. And there are so many ways that we can approach God. We can say, approach him with reverence and awe, or even with thankfulness. And it's important that we come to him with a spirit of humility or with surrender to his will. And none of these things are wrong, but no one of these, nor all of them together can take the place of holy confidence. And to pray with holy confidence means to pray with faith. Faith is the one thing needed in coming to God. In Hebrews 11 and 6, it let us know that without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. In other words, we cannot please God. We cannot draw near to him acceptably, acceptably without confidence, without faith. Jesus, the, I'm sorry, James, the brother of our Lord, instructs us when we're asking for wisdom. In James 1 and 6 through 7, it says, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. 
do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And in order for our prayers to be effective, to be heard and answered by God, it must be offered in faith that he will respond. That is, it must be offered with confidence. And this is the same as Jesus taught in Matthew 21 and 22. He says, you can pray for anything. And if you have faith, you will receive it. Now, true faith certainly involves all those other elements that we were talking about, but in our praying, whatever else it includes, it needs this basic confidence. It empowers those who receive it to approach God with joyful confidence. And we need to believe in prayer. We need to believe that he will engage us in the conversation. You don't ask someone about something if you don't trust their advice. And you don't waste your time asking for something if you don't expect to receive it. A key part of relationships is believing in each other. Now, God may not speak with an audible voice, and he may not even speak during your specific prayer time, but we need to be watching and listening for his responses, and we must trust that he will do what he said he'll do. So our prayers must be prayed in faith. You cannot please God without faith, and anyone who prays to God must believe. But we must also pray according to God's will. In 1 John 5, verses 14 through 15, the NIV version says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. And Matthew 7, verses 7 through 10 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. For he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? So when you pray, just keep the conversation flowing with God. Pray without ceasing. Allow him room to speak. Be sure to listen when he speaks. Pray in faith, believing and expecting. And pray according to his will. These are just basic disciplines that we must put in practice in order, uh, in, in order to continue to build upon and improve our prayer lives. Now, I want to share a few examples of women in the Bible who prayed with amazing results. Hagar prayed for water, and God's response shows us that God will provide our needs in Genesis chapter 16. Miriam's prayer of praise, it reminds us that every victory belongs to the Lord. And then there's Deborah. She prayed a prayer of God's glory. And it just demonstrates to us how God is at work in the great and the small things in the book of Judges chapter 5. Then Hannah, she prayed to God for a child. Her prayer it just invites us to bring our heart's desires to God. Esther, her prayer gives us an example of how we can ask others to pray for us in intercession. And Mary, she did a prayer of blessing, and it just shows us how focusing on God's character offers our hearts joy. Now, the responses to their prayers show us the character of God, and it proves that he answers prayer. So you see, he's still the same today. So what he did for them, he'll do for you. So you see, when we pray, we enjoy our special relationship with God. We triumph over sin. We receive the good gifts of grace, of wisdom, joy, peace power, and holiness. When we pray, we are enabled to do great works. 
When we pray, the devil trembles because prayer is the supreme weapon, the supreme weapon against evil. There is a publication called The Kneeling Christian, and it is considered to be the most widely read book on the topic of prayer. And I'd like to read a portion of it to you from page 17. It says, there is nothing the devil dreads so much as prayer. His great concern is to keep us from praying. Someone has wisely said, Satan laughs at our toiling, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. He trembles when we pray, not because of us, but because of what God does in response to our prayers that make the devil tremble. So what happens when we pray? Walls come down. We see a breakthrough. Relationships are restored. Healing and deliverance takes place. There's transformation and we have a strong connection, a thriving, healthy, growing relationship with God. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Thank you. Oh, Father, we come to you this afternoon and we thank you for our time together. There is so much information regarding prayer, the privilege and power that comes with it. We trust that you have given us what we need for now. And thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit guides us and intercedes for us and prays for us when we don't even know how to pray for ourselves. Collectively, Lord, there's a multitude of petitions, concerns, and requests among us. There is someone here, Lord, battling health issues. Remind them that you have promised us healing in Jesus. No illness is beyond your power. Your hand is on them whether they suffer from sin or physical pain. May each trial strengthen them spiritually and draw them nearer to you. Ultimately, they will experience your healing here or in heaven. There is another dealing with financial issues due to unemployment. May they trust in your provision and that all you've given is used to your glory. Someone needs to be delivered from addiction. We know for we know, Lord God, that you can give them the freedom that they need and the deliverance from this stronghold. Remove the appetite that they have for it. Clothe them with your armor to discipline and subdue their bodies. For every temptation they face, help them to choose the way of escape that you provide. Provide them and remind them, Lord, that greater is he that is in them than he is in the world. There are some who have not trusted you for salvation. We pray in the name of Jesus that they completely surrender their lives, recognizing who they are in you and who they belong to, and allow you to be their Lord and Savior. We pray the same for our unsaved friends and loved ones. May you surround them and place your servants in their path to lead them to you. May their hearts be prepared to receive you, Lord, in the message of the cross. We pray for those who are grieving, that you comfort them by reminding them that you will never leave them nor forsake them. May the emptiness they feel be replaced and filled with your love and healing spirit. We pray for the one with anger issues, that you remind them of your attitude of compassion and graciousness toward them. Give them a change of heart. Increase the flow of mercy in their lives and a desire to be more like you in their attitude towards others. We pray, Lord, for marriages that they are handled with care and strengthened. We pray for peace and reconciliation in troubled households. May they grow stronger day by day in the bond of unity because it is founded on your word. May they grow stronger day by day, Lord God, and may they be founded on your word and rooted and grounded in your love. Lord, there has been so much poured into us today and we pray that you give us the discipline needed to follow through on using what you have equipped us with help us to continuously build our relationship with you by having conversations with you all the time cover us with your armor as we begin to bind and loose utilizing the authority of jesus name 
We ask for total deliverance for ourselves, for our families, for our cities, for our ministries, and for our nation. Please give us the wisdom, knowledge, patience, and understanding needed for this journey. And may we be committed to serve you in obedience, boldness, and love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless each and every one of you. Have a blessed day. Bye.